Pastor Minister Wayne here. He, let me tell you, he speaks all over. He's in high demand. And for him to be here with us is such a privilege. We love him. He is family. Can you all welcome with me Minister Wayne as he brings the word? It's going to be fire. Oh, and can everyone please scooch in? Scooch in. Okay. And may I please have all kids two to six meet me in the cafe. Hey, man. Hey, man. I don't know. Y'all got me feeling like I'm back in the club or something, man. I'm happy I'm in Club Jesus now. Can I, can I, I, I feel it in my spirit. Can I get a little bit of the call and call your name? Yeah, yeah. I want a little bit more of that, man. I am so honored and humbled to stand in front of you 
every time I stand on this pulpit or on a pulpit or on a platform, I get emotional. So I'm, I'm thankful. You see me back there in that corner. <laughs> it's because I still struggle with a little bit of paranoia. People don't know why I'm at. I feel like I got to stand back there and watch stuff. So I remember when I joined this church and I knew we was into social justice. I said, man, I can't sit down. I got to be, if something jump off, I got to be, I got to get at it. <laughs> and it's became my place. Let me tell you something. The first year that Dr. Reverend Stephen Polk started to speak in my life, he said, man, God's going to use you. I was like, dude, you don't know who I am. But once I accepted that God was going to use me, children, this is for y'all. I said, God, you know that I'm your bold son. Now that you've transitioned me over, and I know that you're doing something with me, so I need you to give me a customized assignment. I see that pastor, I see that man of God, I see that man of God, I see that person, I see, I don't wanna be like them. You don't take me from the streets where you let me, you kept me by your grace and your mercy, but you let me be who I was. Don't bring me into this fold and make me like any other flock. Give me a customized assignment. Some of you got to get bold enough to ask God to give me what is for me. I don't want it to look like nobody else. I've traveled out of the country twice now. I get to serve in the penitentiaries, in the juvenile halls, and the one that kills me the most. If y'all ain't met me or don't talk to me, I'm transparent. Because I believe my transparency will bless somebody else. If my transparency will make somebody else believe that God can do in your life what you ain't believe, been believing him for. And so I say that to say I was the ultimate womanizer. And Dr. Reverend Paul told me in my second year of doing ministry that I was going to do work with women. And I said, don't you dare put me in that trap. I would mess up me and them. And now I've spoken at three women's conferences in my life. And I'm honored when sisters say, Wayne, thank you for being a safe space. Today, I'm on assignment, and, and God been talking to me a little too much, more than I wanted. I'm, I'm his, I'm, listen, what you gonna understand about the way I teach and I preach is the relationship I have, the, what I have with God is a relationship, it is not religion. I have a relationship. He's my father. He's my friend. He's my mother. He's my savior. He's my everything. So I can go to him for everything. I can go to God for everything. And I've been in my book long enough to understand that there were some people that was bold enough to tussle back and forth with God. So in some conversations, I can go back and forth with God. And he, can, he don't always change his mind, but sometimes he changes position. It's in here. It's in here. And so, so today, I want to start off with a quote. You got the first slide? I want to start us off with a quote. And I would like everybody to stand up and grab the hands of your neighbor, please. I'm, I'm going to do some stuff different, so just rock with me. Grab the hands of your neighbor. And, and, and when we read this quote together, we're going to read it twice. And the reason why I want you to grab the hands of your neighbor is because I want, I, I understand that sometimes we can make statements and can't believe it for ourselves. So when you make this, when you say this with me, you're saying it for the hand you're holding. 
And if you just happen to be on the edge somewhere, think of somebody that you want this to be a seed for. Now I'm going to say it again. The first time you say it for your person on your left, write whatever you want to do. But we're going to say this twice. I'm setting the foundation. Roll with me. Holy Spirit, have your way. Let's read it together. God is always with you. Your perspective is power. It is not what happens in life. It's how you see it. Your problem is never bigger than God's promise. One more time, please. God is always with you. Your perspective is power. It is not what happens in life. It's how you see it. Your problem is never bigger than God's promise. Sit in that. 15 seconds. Just sit in that. Just sit in that. Don't rush when God is trying to do something. There's a seed that somebody's going to get, and that thing is going to carry you up some time. Let God have his way. Holy Spirit, move in his place. Yes. You may be seated. bow my head in prayer real quick. God, thank you for this time that you already had aligned. Lord, thank you for this space where you've chose to show your face. Lord, remove me, but approve me so that you may work through me. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. In 2002, Verizon Wireless launched a masterful commercial. A lot of us know it as the Can You Hear Me Now commercial. How many people know that commercial? Quite a bit, uh-huh. And what I come to understand that made this commercial so impactful was they cover four points. And the four points quickly was a place, a plan, a purpose and a promise. The commercial started out, or the commercial would make sure that the guy was in a remote place. And so what they wanted to do was convince you that no matter where you were with their service, you still get connection. Place. What they did in believing that their commercials would be good is they prepared plans that would match the fluctuation of new customers that would come into the flock. So they created new plans that would, would, would be super competitive to, the cust to, their, um, to their competition. Somebody say plan. plan. The whole purpose of these commercials were to pull people, they were one of the first carriers to be aggressive about taking other people's customers. The purpose was that if we do this commercial, roll this out, give these good plans, we will bring a new fluctuation of customers, say purpose. purpose. And the promise was not just that you would have better service in any of the new, in these places where you might feel disconnected with others, but they also had a big promise that we will give you a gift card for changing over to us. I've seen friends that have got $200 and $250 gift cards for changing over to Verizon from a new, another wireless. Somebody say plan. plan. And today God simply brought me to let you know that he has a place he has a plan, he has a purpose, and he has a promise. And if you choose to go through his process, you'll find yourself in the promotion, in the place of promotion. Mm -hmm. I don't just talk this, I walk this. This has been my life. A lot of times when I preach and teach, I'm teaching what God sat me down and taught me. And then I get to just invite you into the conversation. So it's real for me. Today we'll be starting. Now I'm gonna give you a fair warning. We about to go to school, so move with me. We gonna, we gonna, be, we gonna be moving. 
We're going to be moving. Uh, the Holy Spirit is going to have its way, but we're going to be moving. We're going to start in Mark 8. Mark chapter 8. Hmm. Okay. Now, let's read. They came to Bethsaida, and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man, he took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. When he had spit on the man's eyes and put his hand on him, Jesus asked, Can you do you see anything now? Do you see anything? Okay, some say different stuff. He looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. Once more, Jesus put his hand on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were open. His sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Jesus sent him home, saying, Lord, help us. Saying. I can't see that, y'all. Do I have to rock with it? I'm going to go on and rock right here. Uh, Jesus sent him away saying, don't go back into the village on your way home. Mm -hmm. The word of God. My first point I want to make is give you some little background on this. This is the only place that this story happens in all the Gospels. If you know the Gospels, it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And normally they have all the stories, but they tell them in different ways. This particular story is only in Mark. So there's a distinction to this story. God told me to tell somebody that there's a distinction to your story too. Not only does, do he want to restore it, but he wants to redeem it. And this is the simple nugget that he told me to drop. He said, tell them to stop denying what they did so that you can discover what I'm doing. Say it one more time. God said, tell them. It might be only for five of y'all. Tell them, stop denying what they did so that you can discover what I'm doing. Denial begots unforgiveness. A lot of times God can't bless unforgiveness because it takes up such a place where he wants his blessings to flow. It can be like a rock blocking the water from flowing. Second thing that we see is this city, say place, place. called Bethsaida. It's interesting about Bethsaida. Bethsaida is the home of three of the disciples. Uh-huh. Andrew, the first one to follow Jesus, check John 144. Andrew was an apostle. I mean, he was he he followed, he was one of the people that followed John the Baptist. And then he saw Jesus and he said, I'm rocking with him. So he started following Jesus. His brother is Peter. So then he, he, he went and got Peter. And then the brother named Philip. It's all in John 1, 38 through 30, 44. You can check it out. And, 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 and so Bethsaida is the hometown of all three of these first followers of Jesus. Okay? If you check Luke 10 and Luke 11, you find out one of the most important points about Bethsaida. It was a cursed city by Jesus. It was a rejected city by Jesus. Matthew 10, Matthew 11, Luke 10, check it out. And what makes that important is so many times things and people and places that get familiar with us will leave us rejected. But here's what God showed me in this Bible. He says, son, do you see? It says, when they arrived at Bethsaida, some people brought Pay attention to how the word in the Bible is very particular. It didn't say friends. It didn't say family. It said some people. It's important. 
because these are some people. These are not his friends. These are not his family. These are really some people. And the Bible says some people brought a blind man to Jesus and they begged him to touch the man and heal him. Here is the message out of this. Is it very clear if the city called Bethsaida is the city of rejection, the people that brought him are the people of rejection, is it possible that he was handed over by way of rejection? Say it again. <laughs> if the city, which we know, called Bethsaida, is a city of rejection, and these are the people of Bethsaida, so they are the people of rejection, then it's very clear that the blind man was handed over by way of rejection. And God told me to tell you that so many times the only way he will get your attention is when you come handed over by rejection. Maybe it might be neglect. Maybe you might feel unprotected. But God will allow you to be handed over by way of rejection or something that is very uncomfortable before the miracle. Because the miracle is about to take place. Somebody say place. place. Uh-huh. What we also see next is it says Jesus took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. He took the blind man by the hand. This is what God showed me. Here, let me, let me stop and, and make this point. People ask me all the time, how do you know you hear the voice of God? <laughs> I love this question. Because I send it back with another question. How do you know the voice that you know the most? Because you're in close proximity? Because you spend a lot of time? Same thing with me and God. For my children and for everybody in here, the reason why I stand here on this pulpit is because my secret place. That's it and that's all. Ain't no other secret to it. I have secret places where I am intentional about giving God his time. The word that I heard from God when I was transitioning my life that changed my life. I was crying in tears because I still wanted to live the lifestyle with the money and the cars and everything. And I said, God, I know you're doing this, but this don't feel comfortable for me. You're stripping me of everything. My identity is in this stuff. I'm somebody. And over here, I'm nobody. And he said, son, you don't curse me by telling, you, telling me who you are not. But if you come on this side and go crazy like you did on that side, I'll take you to places you can't even imagine. See, he know how to speak to me. <laughs> he know how to speak to me. He got to get a little rough and he got to get a little, you know, he got to give me some up. It ain't just that I can't, I can't hear it like that. Got to get my attention. He says he took him by the hand. And, and this is what God told me. He said, do you see where the blind man came with his hands up? This is how me and God talk. I said, man, I do not see no hands up. No hands up. No hands up. He says, Jesus took the blind man by the hand and led him. God, here we go. That's how I talk. Here we go. Come on. I know you're going to do it, but so, so let's go on ahead and show me. Show me. He says, son, go, go, go to verse 26. It says, Jesus sent him away, saying, don't go back into the village on your way home. Here we go. He wasn't from Bethsaida. Huh? Okay. Let me paint it for you. He wasn't from Bethsaida. You got to catch this part. He was from a blessed place. Watch this. How do I know it was blessed? Because Jesus sent them back there. And Jesus ain't sending you nowhere where there isn't a blessing for you. 
Hallelujah. So I know it was a blessed place. It was this place of healing. It was this place. But how many times do we get off a track and take our own plan? Hallelujah. So the man was in a blessed place. He chose to say, Jesus, I'm going to walk away from you like most of us do. Let me do it my way for a little while. Found itself in this city of rejection. Uh huh. I believe that when he went to this city, he was not blind. I know his eyesight was restored because it says it right here. So he wasn't always blind. That's a fact. I believe that he was not always blind, and I believe that he wasn't blind when he went to Bethsaida. Why do I believe that? Because so many times we are walking on the right track and know exactly where we're going, and then we detour with him or her and find ourselves like, who the hell am I? Wow. Blind. Who am I? Where am I? How do I get back? Blind. So I believe that the young man went on his own path and he found himself blind by the sin that was in this city. How do I know there was sin in this city? The reason why Jesus said he rejected them is because they wouldn't repent. Blind. But Brother Wayne, you said his hands was up. You got to see it in the spirit. He had his own plans, but had to put his hands up and give up his plans. So by them bringing him, he had to make up his mind, I need to get where you need to take me, and it's out of here. And so many of us come to Jesus with our hands up. But here's the tricky part. Hands up don't equal the place of surrender. Hands up equals the place that I don't want to go back. Hands up don't equal surrender. But Jesus does something for him. And the whole plan for this man is for him to put his hands in Jesus' hands. And God told me to tell you that all I'm looking for you to do is put your hands in my hands. Not easy as it sounds. Here it is. Hands up equals hands off. I give up my plan, God. But here is the tough part about the place. When we say hands up, hands off, we find ourselves in the intersection of rejection. And what's tough about the intersection of rejection is you find yourself in a place of, God, I don't want to back, go back, but I'm too scared to go forward. The intersection of rejection. I'm right here. I'm not going back to them that or there. But God, I don't want to come where you're trying to take me either. Because I'm not healed. I'm still hurting. I'm still angry. I still got pain. It's the intersection of rejection. And God is saying, if you move from just hands up to hands out, then I can do the new thing. He's saying, I'm trying to take you from religion to relationship. I'm trying to take you from follower to friend. I'm trying to take you from just singing to surrender. I'm trying to take you from hands up to hands out. His hands had to not just be up. That was for the humans to bring him, but for God to lead him. And so Jesus, God is telling me to simply tell you that too many of you let me meet you, but won't let me lead you. <laughs> Say it again, because that one need to hit somebody. Like it hit me over my head. Too many of us allow God to meet us, place but won't let him lead us. Surrender. Hallelujah. Jesus, I feel like we got to move. That was good. Then, 
this, 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 is, this is crazy. I know it is because many of us look at this. Then spitting on the man's eyes, he laid hands on him and asked, can you see anything now? Spitting on the eyes. Jesus spit on the man's eyes, y'all. <laughs> now, I don't care how holy I get. You can tell me Jesus and anybody, and I got some, some triggers in me. And, 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 and <laughs> Lord, help me. If I feel spit hit my eyes, I'm going to turn back into the old me really fast. <laughs> Hallelujah. Help us, God. Here's what God told me to tell you about this. This was a test in his natural. <laughs> Help me, Holy Spirit. Jesus was trying to see if he could pass the test in the natural. The spirit represents that, 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 that most humbling and place of humility that God brings us to so he can meet us in a different way. It's a test. And listen, listen what God said to tell you. He said, tell them that, that this was the test to see if he was really ready to surrender. Because when you come to a place, listen, of your natural breaking down, then my super can break in and the supernatural who can break through. I'm going to say it again. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. When your natural is breaking down, mm -hmm. my super can break in, and then there could be a supernatural breaking through. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Sasa. It's right there. I ain't make it up. It's right here. Here's where my teaching got tricky, y'all. I'm, I'm excited now, as y'all can imagine, so far. I'm like, oh, we finna preach this thing. And, 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 and the voice of God said, we done there. We done there? No, here we go. No, don't, don't start. Don't start none, won't be none, God. We, we on. We on. Like, you got me going. That's only two verses, and we teaching. We, we done there. I'm not done there. What, what, God, let's, come on, let's finish. He, he, we, got, we got 24, the man looked, and, and he looked like trees, and like then Jesus planted it, he did it again, and it's a lot to preach here, God. We're done there, son. A lot of times we don't receive the word when God tells us we're done somewhere. Uh-huh. But see, I know God well enough that I fight with him. How God, can I? Come on, come on, come on. He said, my stubborn son, we're done there. But because you're so stubborn, I'll give you this. In 26, it says, Jesus sent him away saying, don't go back into the village on your way home. He said, tell somebody, stop going back to old places with your new vision. Stop going back to new places with your new vision, with your new anointing, with your new appointment, with your new grace, your new mercy. Stop taking it back to the old places because the second time will get you worse than the first. I, I, I'm a witness. God, God, okay, cool, you gave me that. Now give me the rest. We're done there. Later that night, in my prayer room, I realized something. The teacher only gets silent when the student is taking the test. There was silence. God gets silent sometimes. He's still there. The thing said, God is always with you. He's still there. But he's teaching you something. In the silence. Somebody sitting here right now, God's voice is not clear. You can't even hear it. He's silent. He's teaching. What is the lesson? What is the lesson? The teacher gets most silent when the students are taking tests. I say, oh, here we go. Okay, so you want to test me right now. Okay. All right. And I have intentional places that I go when I need to hear from God. One of them is my prayer room. Nobody judge me, but one of them is the steam room at the gym. The steam room is so instrumental that if I don't want to hear from God, I'm not going. I, I, 
God, I don't want to hear. Like, if I know I did something and he's going to get me and I'm, I don't feel like crying, I don't feel like hearing. Nope, nope, no steam room today. I'll do the sauna, do the hot tub, swim. No steam room, nope. Not doing it. I like the steam room, though, because I can get in there. I cry like a baby. Nobody don't see me. The steam is everywhere. They can't tell me. <laughs> My intentional place. I'm so intentional. Hear me? This is important. This is, we sing songs talking about I'm chasing after you. We ain't chasing, the church ain't chasing God enough. Matter of fact, he's chasing us and we're running after everything else in the world. Hallelujah. So, so I made up my mind. First thing in the morning, I'm getting up. I'm going to the steam room because I need to hear from God. He got to finish this word. Sure enough, I wake up 7 o'clock in the morning. Now, here's my, my intentionality, y'all. My gym is closed. They fair. So I'm like, I got to go all the way to Harry to the steam room. <laughs> I don't even go there. That's traffic. And then coming back, like, I got to do want what God has for me. I want what God has. How much do you really want what God has for you? Do we have momentary drive-by visits with God? That's what I think most of us do. Drive-bys. Give me a shot now, God. Going through something. Now, so I get my butt on the freeway, head out, I need water because the sea room, you need to be hydrated. I didn't have a bottle of water. I like the big bottle of core. So there's a 7-Eleven off the exit, um, Jackson Street. So I pull into 7-Eleven, and boom, there you go the voice. Sit down. Let's talk. Being honest with y'all, I'm telling y'all what a real relationship with God can look like. Don't think I'm not playing with you. I'm dead serious. Standing here with no credentials, just on a sign. Because of this place I spend with God. Don't get it twisted. I'm just like the disciples. I ain't got a perfect bone in me. But boy, I love my God. Because I know where he pulled me from. And not only do I know where he pulled me from, I'll never forget that I felt like in the streets and in that lifestyle, I was riding a high horse, had a name, was so bold and was so big, and I found myself at the rock, at the rock bottom. The beautifulest thing happened in that moment is I found out God was the rock at the bottom. Yeah. Pull up to 7-Eleven, sit down, don't move. Here we go. I know this voice, here we go. I got, I got like, I really would like to just get to the gym and we could do our thing, like for real. <laughs> Cause I, I'm feeling the workout right now. Like I'm really, yeah. I drank my little uh, uh, um, matcha tea, so I'm, I'm energized and I, I need <laughs> matcha, man. Yeah, it's natural, natural. It's natural. I don't need no energy drink. Matcha, get you some matcha tea. <laughs> help, help. Not, not, not maca, not M A C A, M A T C H. One of the things I'll tell y'all I want to do as I continue to walk with God is I want to give health tips every time I preach. We need to be the whole being. Whole being. 7 Eleven, parking lot. I don't even know these dudes. I see too many hanging around. My little paranoia kicking in. I'm like, God, you suck. Get your Bible. It's already where it's supposed to be. Because when, when God has given me a word, I set the atmosphere for him to speak for me anywhere. So my Bible in my house, in my room, will be where he needs me to have it. My Bible in my car will be on the same scripture that he's teaching me. My Bible in my kitchen will be. Everything will be set for him to speak for me whenever he wants to. Get it? It's already there. And then I hear, go back. Go back. Go back. Let me show you the purpose of the blind man. He's, the first thing he said, next slide. Here's, here's what he said. He told me, the blind man was a story of miraculous restoration, but I'm, new, I'm doing a new thing. Do you see it? I said, like I am, no, I don't see it. But I know you should show me. 
go back. I just started out the story in 22. What I had to do is I opened my Bible and I went back some verses. When you find yourself reading the Bible and sometimes you don't understand that particular scripture, try this, go back or go forward. Sometimes God will reveal things. He, he, said, he said, I'm doing a new thing, do you see it? I said, okay, here we go. So the blind man was just for restoration. But the blind man didn't get anything new. He just got restored to what he already had. But that's not a new thing. God said, I'm doing something new. So I found myself on Mark 8 and 14. Here we go. Now, here's something interesting. The blind man's story isn't in the Bible and isn't in any other uh, gospels. But this story and the story after this is in other gospels. I'm going to say it again. The blind man's story is not in the other gospels, but this one, that's before his story, and the story right after his story are in the other gospels. Let's read. The disciples had forgotten to bring bread, except for one loaf they had with them in the boat. Be careful, Jesus warned them. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. They argued with one another and said, it is, because we, it is because we have no bread. What that tells you right there is Jesus was mad at them. I know we don't paint that picture. These is his friends. He get mad at them. If you really, we, we, we can keep reading. He was not happy in this moment. Watch how it reads. They, aware of their discussion, Jesus asked them, why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes? Listen, it's here. But fail to see and ears, but fail to hear. And don't you remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many basket full of pieces did you pick up? One answer. How many of y'all only responded with one word when your parents was mad at you? One word. See, we talk about the disciples that talk too much most of the time. <laughs> Twelve, they replied. And when I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many basketball pieces did you pick up? Seven. He's mad at them. One answer. He said to them, do you still not understand? That is right before. Nothing else is said, then the blind man shows up. Let me go on and paint this picture. God told me to tell you, this was not about the blind man. This was about the disciples. The blind man didn't have an appointment. The disciples had an appointment to flip the world on the right side. So because they couldn't see me for who I was, I had to go to my daddy and ask him to do a miracle. I really believe Jesus took one of his 10-minute breaks and said, God, these fools of yours that you sent me, they ain't getting it, and I need you to do something. And so God said, go on, go to Bethsaida, a city that you don't even like. I got a blind man. I'm going to do something there. This ain't about the blind man. Blind man was restoration. The disciples needed to see a new thing. Hallelujah. Ah, Jesus. It, 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 it gets good when we go. So you see, ho, 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 here we go. You see, at the end it says, don't you understand yet? He asked him. You see it? He asked him, do you not understand Pay attention. Silence. Silence. And then he moves over to the story with the blind man. I'm going to say it again. Silence. Moves over to the story with the blind man. And then the disciples say nothing during that whole thing. God told me to tell you I had to take them from being speakers to spectators. Sometime I need to take your title from you. I need to take your position from you because it is the only place that I can find good relationship with you so you can really sit your butt down and be humble and understand me. Amen. 
he had to take them from speaker to spectator. God also told me to tell you when he said right here, sit, he said to them, do you not understand? He silenced them. God said, tell my people, stop being worried when you don't have all the answers. Trust me. Listen for me. Wait for me. To put a cap on how clear we are about this being for the disciples, we will move over to Matthew. Matthew tells the end of the story. Now, Mark has his own version of the end of the story, but Matthew has his version. In Mark, in, in Mark it just simply says that he told them, he asked them a question. So right after the thing with the blind man, he comes into this place. So he's talking to the disciples before, and then he starts talking to them right after. And the whole time, they are silent. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked the disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? Listen, he's testing them. He's testing them because he's taught them. They replied, some, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Here's the main question, y'all. But what about you? He asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. God said, tell my people that I had to take them from seeing me as teacher to Messiah. Because so many times when you see me as teacher, you will avoid me during testing time. But when you see me as Messiah, you will rest in me in testing time. Hallelujah. Hmm. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. So we finally wrapped up the purpose. The purpose was to get the disciples to move from just seeing him as teacher to Messiah. Why? Why did, was it so important for them to pass that test? Because proper preparation will push you into the promotion and the promise. There's a promise on a disciple's life. The promise is that the Holy Spirit would come and they would be the world changers and they would be the reason why we're sitting here now. There was all kind of promises on their lives. Jesus had to be intentional about what he did with them, for them, so that they can be promoted into the promise. Look at the promise. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades, which is hell, will not overcome, will not prevail. I will give you, you hear all these promises? I will, it's, only, it's right after the, the, the blind man, the promises. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whether you, whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone what, that he was the Messiah. Hallelujah. He never claimed himself as the Messiah before now. <coughs> Let me close this thing. The promises of God. The promises of God are unchangeable. It's just us that change so many times. Here's a point I need you to know. The disciples didn't get it all right about after this. So it's not about passing every test. It's about passing the right test. After this, they got promoted into a different place. Now, the process still had to take place. Another promise is, is he had talked to them about leaving. In John 16, he tells them that the Holy Spirit would come. Promise. And he also tells them that I will leave you, but I will return. Promise. 
in Matthew 28, at the end of his life, the last scripture of Matthew 28, we find another promise. <laughs> this is after the resurrection. And Jesus ascends. He's not in the temple. The women, somebody say the women, the women. went to the tomb. The women went to the tomb, and Jesus caught them on their way back in joy and told them, tell the disciples to meet me in Galilee. It is funny. This came to me this morning. I'm going to just be obedient. It's funny how so many places in the Bible, the woman at the well, the women right here, that carry the message of the Holy Savior, but the church be talking about but women can't preach in the pulpit. Ain't that something? The women were some of the first ones to carry the message. The disciples were scared somewhere. And the women went to the place and brought the message back. They find themselves. So they was obedient to what the women told them. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. This is their first encounter since the resurrection. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Promise. Promise. I am with you. I might have to leave you. I might get silent, but I am with you, and I need, to, I need you to see me. I got so excited, I forgot to give y'all my title. Because out of the Verizon commercial, the title of my sermon was, Can You See Me Now? Since they said, Can You Hear Me Now? If, you go, if we go back, and we don't need to, you don't need to take the slide back. This is the point I want to make. At the end of the Verizon commercial, it is not finished until the guys say good. Do y'all remember that? Do you hear me? Good. They got their promotion when Jesus gave them the promise because Jesus said, it is good that you see me as the Messiah now, so now I can promote you into the next promise. God is looking for us to be able to say, I see you for who I see you as God, so he can say good and promote you into the next promise. The, pr the, the promise, it's a process, y'all. It's a process. Last, last, last slide. Or no, not last one. But Acts. We find in Acts 2 where the Holy Spirit, the promise, finally comes. He promised them in John 16. The promise finally comes, and they find themselves. And when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound, all together in one place, all together in one place. Suddenly the sound like a blowing violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were, where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came and rested on each one of them. All of them were filled with the Spirit, and the Holy Spirit began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. When you step into this new place, the God will give you the Holy Spirit that will enable you to do things you never could do. I am a walking testimony. And I'll close with this. When that Holy Spirit hits you, there's a shift. There's a shift. And the shift wasn't just for the disciples. The, the shift, help me, Holy Spirit. The shift was because God wanted to wave his finger at Satan and say, do you see me now? <laughs> see, you thought my Savior, my son was going down and he was done, but no, he's up and now we at you. You thought you had Peter when Peter tried to deny Jesus from going across. And Jesus had to rebuke him and tell him, get behind me, Satan. You thought you had Peter, but you didn't have Peter. Peter is the first one that saved 3,000 lives. There's a shift. Can I tell you, when God does a shift in your life, can I tell you what it means? Next slide. This is what God wants to say to Satan. Show in hell, I'm forever taken. Shift. 
S H I F T. Showing hell. He wants your life to show hell that I'm forever taken. You don't have no authority over nothing that I'm doing for God no more. I am going to get everything that God has for my life. I am going to heal the sick. I am going to touch the blind. I am going to bring people to God. I am going to bring people to Jesus. My family won't be messed up no more. My finances won't be messed up no more. I will do what God has for me to do. Somebody say shift. Hey. Thank you, Jesus. My God. That's what God wants us to see him in the right way for, because he wants to bring a shift to our lives. I hope that the word has blessed and planted a seed for somebody that God is calling you to the place of shifting. He wants you to see him in a new way because he has something so amazing for your life. I truly love y'all as a family. I am so happy God sat me with this family. There's no place like the way. So I just hope that you experience the spirit today. Not Wayne, the spirit of God. And I hope that my testimony standing here on assignment gives you some encouragement. Oh, some days it gets tough. 